This is Kim Simon, 15 years old, out of New York. She was found murdered with S.A. She was supposed to walk to a friend of hers house, and she didn't make it there. A man was convicted of the crime and spent 19 years in jail. The Innocence Project of New York stepped in and did some DNA testing that proved that he was innocent. It's good for them. Appreciate when that happens. But one thing I see here, because that case was used in comparison to Darley's, and one thing that I see here that's a little bit different is those people aren't on the internet, you know, screaming and hollering at other people. They're actually taking their money and trying to find the killer. This costs money. This costs money. But it provokes responses that may find information that could lead to the killer. This is something that Darley's family doesn't do. There's a suggestion instead of you know trips to the day spa and putting pools up in your backyard. You know, when you're begging for money for twenty seven years, you would expect to see something like this one time at least. Let that sink in. Yeah, Stephen Barnes was convicted of her demise. And I wanted to show the opinion on the appeal from them that there were a lot more things that convicted him than the false DNA. I want, you know, he's proven to be innocent. But it says the defendant was convicted of the rape, sodomy, and murder of. 16-year-old Kimberly Simon, on September 19, 1985, the victim's body was found in a secluded area near a gravel pit off Mohawk Street in the village of Whitesboro. So, I did this. That would be up in this area in, near Utica, and this would be Cavanaugh Road, which is actually the street that Barnes lived on. Uh, her walk, her walk, she lived in this area over here. And her walk was to go down to, around, she was found in, right around, let's see, let me bring it up. The area that she was found in is, like, right in here. Uh, he, so this map from the case, you know, it would show that what I just showed. Now, there were a lot of other things that convicted him. See, there were witnesses that placed both the victim and the defendant on Mohawk Street at approximately 6 p.m., which is about 15 minutes after she left her house. The defendant was identified near his pickup truck, which was parked adjacent to Mohawk Street. The victim, who was seen walking along Mohawk Street, was also seen in a pickup truck, which was about to enter Mohawk Street. Laboratory analysis revealed that hairs found in the defendant's truck were similar to those of the victim. Soil samples from the defendant's truck were similar to those taken from the place where the body was found. An imprint in dirt lifted from the defend fender of the defendant's truck was consistent with the fabric on the jeans worn by the victim at the time of her death. Additionally, the defendant made an admission of guilt to one Robert Stolo, an inmate at the Oneida County Jail. See, I hate, I hate inmates. I hate when they use an inmate <laughs> to testify against another inmate, because that inmate usually gets some kind of prom, some kind of prize for that, even though they try to show, even though they say there's no promises and nothing in that. It happened in my son's case. You know, they had every bit of evidence against him, but they had this guy uh, Dustin Middleton who was in in with Luke. I said, oh, yeah, Luke admitted to everything. He told me he did everything and blah, blah, blah. You know, I actually had a Facebook conversation with him. He said, no, that never happened. We were talking about how Kelsey did it. They wouldn't have let me admit that. But the thing of it is, is when this guy was on the stand, he was in his jailhouse blues. 
and court was about two o'clock. You know, when he got got up and gave his testimony, in which we did catch the detective telling a lie, you know, because they were wondering how he knew all this information that wasn't released to the public yet. But our lawyer got the detective to admit that this inmate was given a file on the case. So, anyways, he was in his jailhouse uniform at 2 o'clock, he testified. And then about 4 o'clock, he was released. So that's why I don't give any credit to jailhouse snitch. But anyways, the court did not dis disabuse its discretion, allowing the mission into evidence for photographs of the deceased you know, they were trying to say that that was necessary, blah, blah, blah. And it was. It is necessary. We also find that the dual photo array identification procedure was not only unduly suggestive, while the defendant's photograph was the only one included in both arrays, the passage of two and a half years between the two arrays negates any possibility of suggestiveness. That's... that's Uh, the circum circumstantial, yeah, because that was all circumstantial evidence, except his, you know, the dirt being similar and the hair being similar, and that doesn't prove anything. Here, the inmate Stoto defended by, that during a conversation in which the defendant Stoto and another man were discussing some girls, the defendant said, "You mean the one I killed?" and then said, "I mean the one I'm accused of killing." <laughs> Defendant statement could <laughs> a revelant omission of guilt. This is some of the junk that he was convicted on, and I don't believe he made this statement. So this is her Facebook page that exists, you know, even so many years after her the crime. This is something that the Darley Routier family has not done. They have not put up a Facebook page, offered a reward. They have not done any of this. Instead, they come on to social media and try and convince people that she's innocent with bullshit lies. That's their advocacy for Darley. That's what they do. They're not doing this either. All right? I've never seen them do this. They don't ask who killed Devin and Damon. They only ask, let her out. They don't offer a reward for information that leads to a conviction. They don't do that. They don't do anything like this. Common sense approach. A small group of Whitesboro High School graduates decided to come together and not give up on trying to find Kim's killers. Some of us knew her well, some did not. From that effort, the documentary project, spearheaded by Nick Sardina, is the next level in the process by her fellow classmates and loved ones in never letting... Oh, this project spearheaded by Nick Sardina is the next level in the process by her fellow classmates and loved ones never letting her be forgotten please stay tuned for more we know someone knows something that can break the case darley's family is not doing this they're not following the leads of someone who is interesting in finding the actual killer of their grandkids their nieces and their nephews you know their friend darley's family is not has never approached the Never approached it this way. Let's see this trailer. She was just a sweetheart. She was just a sweetheart. She was funny, kind. She was just a uh, bright young girl who had an incredible future ahead of her. I was supposed to um, meet Kim at 6.30 right here. I called her parents and I told them she didn't show up. And uh, from there on, 
All hell broke loose. They showed me a picture of Candace and asked if I knew her, and when was the last time I saw her. I knew some, something wasn't right, because I wasn't like him. When I parted the brush, I was face to face with Kimberly. matching camp description in a pickup truck. We have witnesses stating that there was two vehicles speeding down full time. No, I believe that was uh, the downfall of her life was how pretty she was. We got the guy, we got the guy, we've got the evidence, etc., etc. When the guilty verdict on Steve Barnes came down, he said, this kid isn't guilty, he's innocent. Sometimes people just want the case to solve it. People just want the case to solve in quotes. Uh, I remember thinking those were unusual pieces of evidence. It just made it even worse. I mean, another tragedy, nearly 20 years, you know, behind bars for a crime that he didn't commit. A lot of the same names keep coming up. Where was she? Was she out in the woods? Was she at a house party? We got a six hour window. You mean nobody saw this girl in six hours? You heard what she described as a blood-curdling scream. It's just like there's so many people here that she knows, and she's like, I don't know how this went so, so wrong. Everybody knew he did it, but everybody was too afraid. When I was pulling up there, there was freaking cops everywhere. He just, like I said, would say, I'm going to end up like that girl, Kim. What, what went on in that area? Something, something that... That's been a million-dollar question that has haunted me to this day. So, I've never seen Darley's family in all the years, and even when I was a supporter, do anything like this. Who, you know, who killed Devin and Damon? They could put their money together and put a documentary together, and they could spend their life passing out flyers instead of coming on the internet and getting angry with people who feel like they, the court's got it right. They make Darley look guilty when they do that because of her lineage. So we can't compare these two cases. Hello everyone, Nick Sardina here giving you an update on our Kim Simon docuseries. Right now we are starting episode three. Uh, we have two pretty much done. And by pretty much, I mean we still have to add in graphics and some other things, some cosmetic things. And we're always moving things around, but basically they're pretty, pretty close to being done. So we're starting episode three. Just wanted to keep you involved uh, as we hit mid-September, hit another anniversary of Kim's death. And uh, we'll keep you involved all the way through. We have uh, plan on probably eight to nine episodes. So after each one, we'll give you an update. Thanks a lot. And if that sounds like a warning, then that's exactly what it's meant to be. It deals with the sexual abuse of children by satanic cults. And not only that, human sacrifices as well. In the 1980s, the satanic panic flooded the scene with gruesome cases, resulting in ritualistic abuse, sacrifices, and other obscene acts. People were terrified of it during that time and had no clue on who or what to blame. Dungeons and Dragons and heavy metal music were even put on the chopping block in regards to it. September of 1985, in the rural part of upstate New York, Satanists, multiple suspects, and the police department were put on the spot in regards to a murder of a young high school student. And the case is still being actively pursued to this day in hopes that the family might receive justice to the perpetrators who had taken their daughter away too soon. This is the unresolved murder of Kimberly Simon. Kimberly Simon was born on January 12, 1969 to parents William and Cheryl Simon in the city of Utica, New York. She's been remembered as a kind-hearted and humbly quiet teen who really enjoyed music, football games, and talking on the phone. Her family and friends described her as being full of life and a joy to everyone around her. On Wednesday, September 18, 1985, shortly before 6 p.m., 16-year-old Kim Simon was last seen leaving her home on River Road 
in Mercy, New York, making her way on foot to the Whitesboro High School. She was planning on meeting up with a friend, Linda Fiorini, and some others to attend a football game that night at the school. It was getting later, and Linda had not seen or heard from Kim, which was mentioned to be completely out of her character. She never arrived at the school, and at around 11.30 p.m., she was reported missing by her family. An all-night search party was set up in the hopes of finding Kim's whereabouts, but unfortunately, nothing came of it that night. The next day, around 11.24 a.m., Kim's partially clothed body was found in a wooded area near the Mohawk River in the town of Whitesboro. The wooded area was off of Mohawk Street and not too far from where she and her family lived. She was beaten and strangled to death. Kim also had a bruise on her face, which indicated that she was struck on the head at least once as well. Later on, some personal belongings from Kim's purse and shreds of paper were discovered near the Carolyn Court Apartments by Clinton Street, New York Mills. A few days later on Monday, September 23rd, an anonymous caller found one of Kim's white shoes, which was found in the Sequoia Creek under the bridge near Clinton Street in New York Mills. The news of Kim's discovery devastated the surrounding area, and a full-scale investigation quickly went underway in trying to uncover what exactly happened that night. On the night of her disappearance, witnesses recalled seeing Kim speaking to a young man in a truck along Mohawk Street as she was walking towards Whitesboro High School. The truck the young man drove was said to be a late 70s Chevy or a GMC pickup truck that was a maroon or brown in color. A sketch of the young man was released to the public and his description were that of a man between the ages of 18 to 23 years old with sandy brown shoulder length hair. It was believed that Kim may have been picked up by this young man or someone else with a truck and brought to a popular hangout spot amongst locals called the Three Bears, where a party was held that night. The spot is along the Sequoia Creek in New York Mills, not too far away from where her white shoe and belongings were found. A witness claimed to have seen Kim at this location the night of the murder, along with four males. These four males were reportedly known for satanic rituals and obsessions with the occult. The witness mentioned that they were hiding behind a tree and saw one of the males having intercourse with Kim, who appeared to have been possibly drugged and unconscious. When asked, Kim's family claimed that she would have never attended the party on her own accord. Multiple residents of the village of Whitesboro reported that on the night of Kim's murder, they heard blood-curdling screams between 1 and 2 a.m. They believe the scream came from another hangout spot located by Hearts Hill Elementary School on Clinton Street called the Water Tower and these residents lived very close by to where Kim's body was located. The police quickly shifted focus on 19-year-old Stephen Barnes, whose truck resembled the suspect's description, and it was reported to have been parked nearby where Kim was seen walking that night. When questioned, Stephen's brother-in-law stated that he did see a woman get into a truck along the road, but that it was not Steve's truck, and couldn't confirm if the woman was Kim or not. Barnes was also given an alibi, where people said they had seen Steve at the local bowling alley during the night of Kim's murder. Stephen Barnes was questioned by the police on Saturday, September 21st, three days after the event. Stephen denied any involvement with the murder of Kim throughout the entire 12 hours of questioning. He said he was only in the same location as Kim that night because he was making his way to the bowling alley. Stephen also submitted multiple DNA samples to the authorities. Two and a half years later, in March of 1988, Stephen Barnes was arrested and charged with first degree and murder in the second degree. He was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison, even though his DNA samples tested inconclusive for being on camera at the scene of the crime. Years would go by, and justice felt like it was finally served, with the communities breathing a sigh of relief and with time to mourn the loss of Kimberly Simon. But in 2007, the Innocence Project funded and opened up a case to prove Stephen's innocence. With new and advanced DNA testing, proof came to light that DNA related to Kim's rape and murder did in fact not match Stephen Barnes. But in a shocking revelation, it came from three individuals, two men and one woman. A year later on November 25, 2008, Stephen Barnes was released from prison after spending 19 years in a cell wrongfully accused. 
He was then officially exonerated on January 9, 2009. He ended up receiving a $3.5 million settlement for his wrongful conviction and imprisonment, and I really hope that he's doing well for himself. Seeing pictures of him bawling his eyes out in relief as he testified were really hard to look at, knowing he did no harm, but still faced... That's a, that face right there is a far cry from somebody looking at the prosecutor and going, liar, liar. With the pictures of her victims put right in front of her, facing her, on purpose by the juror, no emotion. This is what a, 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 a sad face looks like. This is what an honest face looks like. It's the iron fence. But that raises the question, was Stephen not being guilty of Kim's death? Who murdered Kimberly Simon? A multi-agency task force started to reevaluate and re-examine Kim's case. Let's so, if Darlene didn't kill Devin and Damon, then who did? And why is that not so important to the family? Why did that, you know, Donnell told me, our family has spent more on DNA testing than you've ever made in your lifetime. All right. So they could, they could, you know, gather funds together to hire a producer and a script writer and write a documentary up that doesn't say things like they were under Greg Davis's spell. This person was inadequate. They're all lying. You know, no, you cannot do it that way. You can present it in how you feel she's innocent without without degrading anyone else. But you, but the thing of it is, is you've never put up a documentary about who killed Devin and Damon. You've never done it. Never. You're not worried about who killed Devin and Damon. You're worried about, in your opinion, Getting Darley out of prison. That's what you, that's the main thing. This led to interviewing hundreds of people who might have had information or even possible involvement. With all the questioning and investigating, the task force narrowed it down to three individuals that Kim supposedly saw that night of her murder. Authorities offered up more information on these three possible suspects. They mentioned their obsessions with the occult, their history of killing cats, abusing psychedelics, and women. All three remain persons of interest. Allison Scrin passed away in 1997, but police are still looking into her possible involvement in information she possibly knew about what happened that night. Less than a month after Kim's murder, a 19-year-old Whitesboro resident named Michelle Michaela Junis and was believed to have known what happened to Kim Simon as well. Richard W. Miller Jr. was described as a Satanist who thoroughly obsessed about death and was sought to be in the involvement of Kim's murder. Richard also spent some time in March of 2010. America's Most Wanted even broadcast an exclusive story on Kim Simon's case back on March 13th, 2010 in hopes of trying to find... Now, why can't you guys get a hold of John Walsh? You know? Why can't you, why can't you do this the right way? Instead, of, you come on social media and you just want to curse out people that think she's guilty. That's really doing a lot for Darley's case. Some you, you're making her look guilty is what you're doing. Some information on what happened that night. It's been 36 years of searching high and low and trying to solve this case and bring real justice to Kim's perpetrators. The family hasn't stopped and the case is continuing on to this day. A $5,000 reward has even been put out to anyone who might know what happened that sad September night. Was a satanic panic causing hysteria, freaking people out into blaming Satanists for this crime? Who was involved? Who knows information? Was Kim even killed by Satanists? Will justice ever be served? I'm hoping someone knows. I can't imagine how the family might feel knowing that their daughter's murderer is still out there walking. Hypothetically. I wonder how the family of Darley Routier must feel, knowing that the killer of Devin and Damon is still out there walking freely. They feel like logging on to fucking TikTok and lying, is what they feel like. They feel like looking into someone who feels Dar Darley is guilty, they feel like looking into his past and, and looking at his record, instead of looking at who could have came into the house that night. You're not looking, you're not going there. 
Somebody knows something if she's innocent. Somebody knows something. Usually somebody talks. Usually that's what happens. Somebody talks. It's been a long time. But you, you're, you're not focusing your energy and, and, and speaking out for her innocence in the correct way. You're not doing it. You make people feel like she is guilty because you constantly get caught in lies and you deflect and you insult and anything. Anything to character assassinate anyone who feels like she's guilty. And you're not going to get her out that way. You're not going to get her out that way at all. Now, when you look on the National Registry of Exonerations, and you look at Stevens Barnes' case, you know, involved with that Kim Simon, you can look and just look at the, the, the how the investigation went about. Just based on what I'm reading here, you know, without any of the DNA, just based on what I am reading here, if I were a juror, I would not have found him guilty. Just on this little bit. I mean, because it's obvious, if you read through this, the National Registration, Registry of Exonerations, look up Stephen Barnes, you can tell how different his case was from Darley's. Because he had witnesses. He had medical testimony that it wasn't him. He had this uh, condition that he was a secretor that his DNA wouldn't show up. Uh, if you read this, here's the trial. See, these two things right here could, you know, it tells me, you know, they don't have enough evidence. See, all of this shows me that he wasn't guilty. I don't know how that jury found him guilty. I don't get it. Now, this is a case that the Innocence Project should have put up just, just based on all this testimony that's in his favor. That, that, that case is nothing like Darley's case. Darley didn't have people sitting on a stand saying that she was innocent. All the medical evidence pointed against her. And it still does. This is the face of what an exoneration. This is the face of a guilty person. So if you want to talk about, you know, compare cases and, you know, get go deeper into it. His case is nothing like Darley's. He should have never seen the inside of a jail based on testimony alone. So I don't get it. I, I don't understand how this man ever got com convicted. I'm glad he's out. And see, so you have you know who did this is those four people that she was with, and the the one that committed suicide. She knew about it. The girl, there was a girl involved in it. You had, you still have who did it, and it wasn't him. <laughs>